Well, good day to you. It is April the 20th. And, you know, the interesting thing about today, I want to say before I get going, um, the calendar day of April the 20th is not unsimilar to what's going on in the world today. And it's definitely analogous to what I talk about in nearly every video. Guess what it is? It's the divisions in the world, right? In fact, I've even mentioned it several times. You know, that's what Jesus was talking about when he said, I come not to bring peace, but to bring a sword, right? It's the, the, Christ principle that's flowing out in tremendous potency that's creating this division. So you know, we see it in different lines of thought all over the in every human endeavor, right? So you got conservatives who think very conservatively that can't understand why somebody would even want to have any kind of progression whatsoever. And then you got those progressive minds that are totally turned off and irritated and quite upset that somebody's not wanting change, you know, and then you got uh, capitalists who think that the world is theirs and they do whatever they want because it's all about money and profit, right? And they are totally upset with and very angry with the fact that there are people who are wanting to save the environment and the people who are trying to save the environment can't understand why somebody would put profit above everybody's safety and and future generations and so forth, right? And then you got people who make messes and those who have to clean it up. And then you got the religious folks that can't understand why somebody wouldn't be religious. And they got the people who are perhaps agnostic or atheist that can't understand why somebody would even possibly believe in what the Bible says. And you got those people who love Neil Diamond and those who don't, right? I mean, there's divisions everywhere, right? So what does it relate to today? Well, today is April the, April the 20th. And there are some people, such as my mother, who view today as like any other day. It's right between the, the 19th and the 21st of April, right? That's it. Then you got other people who, and you might know where I'm going with this, who view April 20th as an unofficial holiday. It's like Christmas in April. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And whatever group you find yourself in, you know, I hope you're having a great April the 20th. This is my point. Whether you're somebody who celebrates 420 or somebody who knows nothing about what I'm talking about, right? I hope you're having a great April, uh, April 20th today. Now, and if you don't know what I'm talking about and you're kind of like, what's this guy talking about? Look it up. I'm not going to spell it out for you. You can find it out for yourself. Just put the number four, two, and zero and Google it and see what comes up for you. You'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. <laughs> now, uh, my name is Gary Willing. If you've never come to this channel before, it's good to meet you and welcome. And what I'm about to tell you might sound crazy enough to where you think I'm in that second group that I actually celebrate April the 20th, even in August. No, actually, I do not. I've never once participated in that hand to God, right? But um, I don't judge people who do, but I've never personally done it. But you, what I'm about to tell you might, you might think that I'm crazy enough to be doing all that. So, um, but nope, just what I'm going to tell you is crazy. Now, what do we talk about on this channel? We talk about the emergence of Maitreya and the Masters of Wisdom. We talk about why are they returning now? Why is it important that they do so? And of course, what does it mean for you? And the underlying purpose of these videos is not to talk about weed. <laughs> It's to talk about oneness, actually. Now, some people actually have to kind of get high to understand it, but, you know, because some people don't believe it at all, or they might kind of intellectually understand it. Other people might be living their life pretty much moment to moment, like, you know, we're living as in one, right? But the truth of the matter is we are all one family. There's harmony and diversity, you know, as they say. And I can show you two quite different events that are going on all around the world and have been for decades that prove to us that we're one. And ironically, it's very similar to what I was talking about in terms of the political divisions, the economic divisions, the, you know, capitalist versus the economist or the ecologist, I mean, or whatever, you know what I mean? They're just that divided, but yet at the same time are teaching us the same lesson that we are one. Now, what do I mean? Well, there are miracles that have been going on all around the world, and you can look them up online. You can you can see for what I'm telling you is true. You know, I'm not making this up. There have been miracles that have been going on all around the world in all walks of life in nearly every country, if not every country, but they've been happening to every single religious group without exception and people of no particular religious faith. And in every instance or nearly every instance, they're leaving those people with a greater sense of hope, a greater sense of an expectancy of the future, perhaps. And therefore... 
I think in their own way, these miracles are telling us that we are one because they're not just happening to the Christians. They're happening to people who are practicing Islam in the Middle East, Judaism in Israel, Hindus around the world and in India, people of no particular faith who don't go to church at all are having miracles. They are happening all over the world, and they have been. So they must be teaching us that we are one. So crosses of light, images of the Madonna, visions of the Madonna, UFOs, crop circles, you know, the healing waters of Teleco de Mexico, Norno Germany, um, and India are just a tiny little bit of examples of these miracles that have been happening all around the world and will continue to happen uh, because the hope for humanity is ongoing and never ends. Now, the other thing is, What's the thing that's different that's also teaching us humanity? Well, that's actually the problems that are facing humanity. The problems of the world, like the environment, affect everyone. Even if we don't think that they do, they are. You know, injustice is affecting every single one of us. Even if you don't think it is, it is, right? Hunger is affecting all of us. Even if you don't think it is, it is, right? So the environment is an easy one to kind of illustrate, right? Because we all breathe the same air. We're all living on this planet together, right? So why is it and how is it teaching us that we're one? Well, if we don't solve the problems together, it's going to affect all of us because we might not have a world we're living in. So then it wouldn't matter how much money you have, where you live, whether you're an American or if you're African, you know, if you're in the bush or what, or, or you're in a modern city, right? And you're, you know, If we don't have an environment to live, we don't have air to breathe, you know, we don't have clean water to drink, well, then what's the point at that point, right? So it's going to affect all of us. And it's also going to take every single one of us to turn the ship around. So I do think that the problems of the world are teaching us, too, in their own way, that we are one. So the other thing, too, that you might really think I'm crazy about is these miracles and even these problems are touching and pointing in to the fact that the teacher who made a promise to every one of the world's religions and to the world as a whole is back and has been speaking on TV uh, for the last 10 years or so. Now, I'll leave you with this. There's hope within the problems too. And the teacher has laid out a very simple solution to the first and most important thing that we have to tackle, which is humanity. He says humanity must create peace. He says without sharing, there could be no justice. And without justice, there could be no peace. And without peace, there could be no future. So, um, I do encourage you to listen to the next part of these videos where I try to answer the questions, but I have over 300 videos where we talk about this. You can look at, you know, the links in the description of the video and get your own information for yourself and answer your own questions yourself. Or you can also post a question as a comment to me and I can try to answer that in the next video like I'm about to do and so forth. So hopefully you'll stick around, but you can stay as long as you want, come as go as you please, as I like to say. Now, I do want to say this too. For those of us who have been listening to these videos who are perhaps wanting to do something to help bring about the principle of sharing, not saying it's the the, the most efficient way, but maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But I, I wanted to kind of just tell you this. I put a link in the description for a uh, petition that you might, if you want to, you can sign it. If not, don't worry about it. Um, it's through sharing.org. I interviewed um, uh, a person who worked with uh, Share the World's Resources, uh, uh, STWR, uh, back in January. And they have a petition that you can sign and you can read about what the petition's about. But it's really about um, encouraging and giving a voice uh, to these um, world leaders and our governments to prioritize the money for the people rather than for like military budgets and something. So, And I, I signed the petition weeks ago and I waited and waited and waited to see if I would get any spam email, anything. I did not get one single piece of email from them. So you won't get spammed or anything like that. So um, hopefully you'll you'll take the time to to go to their site. Like I said, links in the description, and you can you can read what they do. They do amazing work. You can also hopefully maybe if you're inspired, sign the petition too. So anyway, thank you for that. Now um, on to the questions. So here we go. First question: Did Benjamin Krem ever speak of the visionaries Emanuel Swedenborg or Chico Javier? Um, my recollection, uh, no. And I actually tried to find anything in any of his books and I couldn't find anything. So if he did, I can't find it. Um, I am sorry. So my apologies, but I hope you're doing well. And thanks for the questions. And all right. Um, next question. Hi, Gary. Can you share with us something about 
the Sunat Kamara. Um, I guess as much as I can from reading Alice Bailey, <laughs> you know, I don't have any kind of inside track on on the uh, uh, on Sunat Kamara. Now, a couple things about Sunat Kamara I want to talk about. So I'm going to kind of expand it out and not just talk about Sunat Kamara, if that's okay with you. Talk a little bit more about the work and activity of the Space Brothers coming from not only Venus but from Mars and so forth. And the reason why I'm talking about that is because according to Alice Bailey, Sanat Kumara came from Venus. And so I, I wanted to kind of talk about it if you don't mind. So according to the Ageless Wisdom teachings, Sanat Kumara uh, is one of the seven most advanced members of humanity in the entire solar system. And of course, is the only Kumara on this planet and came to this planet 18 and a half million years ago. It was referred to to in the Bible, a couple, three different ways. The two that come to mind are the Ancient of Days is one and the Youth of Endless Summers because apparently Sunat Kamara has not aged a day in nearly 19 million years. So whatever kind of skin cream they have on the planet Venus, it's working wonders for him because <laughs> he, he looks younger than me <laughs> and he's a lot older than I am. Now, uh, according to uh, the Master DK, who if you look at the picture of the background of this video, he's right above Maitreya in the top left. So you got three down, three left, you know, that kind of thing. He's at the very top next to uh, Maitreya, right above Maitreya. Um, what he said through Alice Bailey is that uh, Sunat Kamara came when humanity started to incarnate out of the animal kingdom into the human kingdom. And at that point, the average consciousness of what we would consider to be animal man, we would be dumbfounded about how uh, limited our view of life would have been, right? It was all about the instinctual desire to survive, to eat, to mate. You know, that was it, like an animal would, right? Maybe a slightly bit more intelligent than the smartest of animals of today, right? And very primitive, right? Had no idea what was even going on on the other side of the mountain, let, was go, but let alone what was going on on the other side of the, of the world and what was going on in the cosmos and everything, right? And then Sanat Kumara came to this planet. And since then, over the last 18 and a half million years, any kind of advancement that's happened, we really can owe directly to him. Because according to DK, the Master DK, had he not come here, we would really still be at the same point as he was as as it was when he first came here so can you imagine i mean it really is frustrating and embarrassingly slow how humanity is right on this planet and even if you look at it to today you know it's been 10 or so years almost 11 maybe 11 years i guess since uh maitreya did his first television interview and the reason why people haven't recognized him as maitreya because he's not saying it he is he hasn't gotten to the point where he can because we haven't really done what he's initially been telling us to do. So, you know, baby steps kind of thing, but it's just, it's frustratingly slow how dense we are as a people, you know what I mean? And I'm glad I, I'm not really talking to the higher members of humanity on these other planets, because I'd be embarrassed, <laughs> you know, to, where are you from? Earth. Ugh. Woo. Hate to, it sucks being you. <laughs> I'm sure they might think that. They probably wouldn't say it because they're loving people and they, they know occult silence, but I'm sure they've thought that a few times. Like, ooh, glad I didn't incarnate on that planet. <laughs> now, getting back to your question. So, um, Sunat Kumara uh, fulfills a kind of an intermediary role between the souling life around our planet called the planetary logos and all the other life within it. And um, it's so advanced that he can't even live on the physical plane. He's on the etheric plane. So... Um, what also might make you think I'm smoking something is because I'm talking about life on these other planets, right? Is they're not on a different dimension. They're living on higher levels of physicality above gas called the etheric. It was proved scientifically actually by uh, a man named Willem Reich. You can look him up, look up Willem Reich and look up the organ and you can read about it. He discovered the lowest level of the etheric. He called it the organ and saw it as one plane. But he actually, it's actually subdivided into four planes, according to the master. So there's seven levels of physicality, not just three. And these higher members of humanity on these planets like Venus and Mars, you know, we wouldn't see anything if we went there because we can't see the etheric plane and the reality of it is, but they're there. And when they come here on those ships... They're totally invisible to our radar, to us, to pilots, until they lower their vibration down, then they show up. 
you know, and so, and then when perhaps the person gets a little scared, they can just raise their vibration up and disappear. Like the time, the couple times that I saw UFOs, you know, I wasn't drunk or high at the time. I was completely sober. <laughs> um, you know, it, it appeared out of nowhere and then disappeared out of nowhere, you know, we're back into nowhere. So, but they just raised their vibration. They were still there. I just couldn't see it. You know what I mean? So where does this tie into Sanakumar? Well, these members of humanity from these other planets have been helping us since the very beginning, obviously, because he was, he's a one example of it and have been living here sometimes helping us. Uh, they have during some of the most intense crises that humanity has faced and helped us get through it. But right now, the most important thing that these space brothers are doing is they're helping to clean up our atmosphere. We are damaging our environment far worse than even the most alarmist environmentalists are speaking out to today. Most environmentalists like Greta Thunberg and, and others are saying that climate change is the most dangerous thing that's facing humanity. And I'm not dismissing it by saying this because according to Benjamin Crumb's master, he said that it's very dangerous the carbon emissions that are going on. But in fact, it's not the most dangerous thing. And uh, this might come as some shock to you. It's actually nuclear radiation. Now, if you read reports or you talk to a nuclear physicist, they would say, ah, you got nothing to worry about. You can stick your hand right up on it. It's no big deal, right? Because look at my measurements on the Geiger counter. Nothing's moving. It's, it's safe. Well, Little did they know that it's only registering the radiation from the solid, liquid, and gas, and that's it. But the four levels of etheric, uh-oh, right? What about them? And that what happens is, is this radiation is so fine and so thin and so light, it goes right out of the containment, right through the lead, the concrete, and goes right out into the atmosphere. And right past the Geiger counters, which can't even measure it because it's they're so crude. And then what happens, this is really insidious, is it goes way up into the higher parts of the atmosphere. It's so fine. And it kind of floats up there and hangs up there. And then it gets picked up by all the wind currents and the jet stream and so forth. And it can go anywhere in the world. And then it starts getting into the clouds. And then the clouds, of course, turn into what? Rain. And that radiation's in the rain, every raindrop that falls back down to earth. And then it goes right into the soil, right into our drinking water. Even our organic vegetables that we think are safer to eat are absorbing these radiative material and, it, and then we eat it and ingest it. The water that we drink without exception, every single glass of water that we drink, wine that we drink, beer, soda, it doesn't matter. We are drinking in that uh, radiation. Every time we take a breath of air, we're breathing that in to our lungs, you know. It's all over our house. I'm not trying to freak anybody out, but this is a reality of the situation. You can't even taste it. You can't see it. You can't feel it. You can't wash it off. It's all kind of just there. And it's what's making us sick. It's nuclear radiation. And it doesn't matter whether you're standing right next to the containment or not. And anything that is using nuclear power in the, in the way that we process it today is, is emitting this dangerous nuclear radiation and they're talking about putting more nuclear power plants out there for to make more money because they're cheaper you know and this probably one of the first things that my Trey is going to say after he's starting to inspire humanity and galvanizing humanity for changes shut the nuclear reactors down immediately we have to stop this we have to turn it off you know and hopefully humanity will listen to him this time because there's not a lot of time left for us to do this mind you right but um anyway so you know these space brothers and sisters and these ufo's are cleaning up the atmosphere enough so that we're not totally dead you know because we would probably be dead if it wasn't for them so we owe them a great debt sanat kamara and these others we owe a huge debt to them you know and for what they've done now the other thing too I want to say real quick before I gets too I get too long winded on this is the um, there are a lot of people who claim to channel these masters and I don't particularly like pointing fingers at this person does and that person doesn't because it's not my right to say but I can kind of just lay out a generic <laughs> view of them right you know these masters when they communicate with with uh, people right you have to be of a certain level right? And so 
people claim to channel any one of these masters, whether they're real or not, Maitreya, uh, and now even Sanat Kumara, right? I mean, what's next? <laughs> you know, the solar logos, the, you know, I mean, who knows, right? But I'll kind of put it into perspective. I mean, can you communicate with an insect and get it to do what you want to do, right? Can you actually talk to an ant and tell it to move to the left or right? No, right? There's no way. It wouldn't understand you, right? And I would say probably, comparatively speaking, the consciousness of somebody like Sanat Kumara to any one of us would be probably about the same, if not even lower than that, right? So, you know, trying to talk to a plant, you know, maybe, I mean, maybe you can comfort it a little bit, but, you know, I mean, you see what I'm saying? So it's like, I just don't see how that's even possible. You know, I know you're not saying that, you know, but there are people who believe that these people are receiving messages from the ambassador. And so when you look at, um, and I know I'm not, I'm kind of extenuating out the answer to your question, but if, you know, if you look at uh, the work of the masters with some of these disciples, right? And you really read what I think are authentic communications from these masters. There is a huge difference between the two, you know, between somebody who's just claiming to channel these masters kind of has this fluff to it. It's kind of airy, kind of not quite concrete or grounded. And it's just kind of lofty, you know, and there's not a lot to it. And then you read something from the master DK writing through Alice Bailey. And it reads like a college science textbook. It's very scientific, you know, very wordy to some degree, right? And then you read some of the articles, and hopefully you've gone and read some of the articles on uh, the Share National website that Benjamin Krim's master has published, you know, when he wrote those articles through Benjamin Krim. I mean, each word and sentence put there for a reason that was perfectly placed to really express the truth in which this master was speaking, you know, and you can't take anything out or add anything to it. And anytime I try to, even me, you know, and, and you or anybody else try to comment on what Benjamin Crumb's master is saying, it cheapens it. You know, you can't add to it. It's perfect as it is, you know, and then you look at, and I like to talk about Mozart because I'm, you know, I started out being a musician, you know, and I love music and I'm sure everybody that listens to this loves music, right? You know, Mozart worked with these masters, with one of the masters telepathically in the same way. And that master communicated through him and, and communicated his, his words musically out to humanity. Same thing with Bach, same thing with Beethoven. I mean, it's been said that Bach's, the work of Bach is the teachings of the laws of life that even Maitreya is talking about, but it's in musical form. Can you imagine? I mean, it's amazing, right? And there are writings or musical uh, script, you know, that Mozart wrote that, that the first violin piece is written normally and the second violin piece you flip the first one upside down and play it exactly how it is and it creates perfect harmony i mean it's just how would somebody ever come up with that if it wasn't of some kind of divine inspiration you know what i mean it's just but yet so simple so beautiful so eloquent so timeless even right that our music of today doesn't even compare to mozart you see what i'm saying so you can really look at the the gulf of difference between the two, between average music and Mozart, between an average person writing something and uh, one of these masters really working through a disciple in that way and so forth. But I don't even think, even somebody like Alice Bailey, Mozart, or somebody like um, Benjamin Krem, who I think really did, you know, had telepathic contact with these masters, could even receive a telepathic communication from Sanat Kumara in that way. I just don't think it could even happen that way. So I don't know if that answers that question. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't. But anyway, thanks for the question either way. So next, uh, it's kind of the same question. You know, is what makes an ascended master different from saints, sages, and prophets if there is one? Well, the saints, sages, and prophets of both Western literature or history and even of Eastern, of the Indian history or whatever, I guess it would depend when they lived, really. You know, was it hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago? Then probably more than likely they're already a master. They weren't a master then. They were just higher members of humanity, but they now probably easily become masters. You know, all the biblical figures 
pretty much are masters now, right? All the saints throughout the the last 2,000 years or so, the 1,500, you know, the, at least the first 1,500 years of the last 2,000 years are definitely all masters now. When they were saints at that time or whatever they were, priests or whatever, they were disciples of the master Jesus. And then they became masters after a few lifetimes and so forth. But if you're talking about somebody like, let's say, I'm not Catholic, so I can't list it off, you know, you know, Mother Teresa, right? There's talk about canonizing her. And the work that she did was, I consider to be not only inspirational, motivational, but yet I could see them seeing it as saintly in a lot of ways, right? And they are, there's talk of trying to canonize her, right? She's not evolved enough to be a master. And I'm not taking anything away from who she is as an individual. She's, she's an amazing person or was an amazing person. And for me, she's one of the most inspirational figures that I can think of, right? But she's not a master. She was on par with somebody like even uh, Princess Diana, you know? She was actually at the level of the average world leader of today and yesteryears, you know? So if you think of all the presidents of the United States, right? You have the Abraham Lincolns, you have the George Washingtons, the Thomas Jeffersons, the um, uh, Roosevelts, the John F. Kennedys, you know, the, the, the biggies, you know what I mean? Especially Abraham Lincoln. And then you got everybody else, right? <laughs> you got the president, you're like, you know, they, they do their four years or their eight years, and then it's kind of like, that's pretty much it, you know? And historians kind of go, oh, yeah, you know, I forgot about that guy, right? That president, right? The average of those is about the level of Mother Teresa. So you see what I'm saying? Even though she breathed as she served, I mean, that's one of the things that Maitreya said about her. She breathed as she served. He used her as an example of, for all of us, how to serve in our life. You know what I mean? She's an example of it, right? And you can't say that about some of the politicians today now, can you, right? But they are about the same level as her. And I know it's hard for people to rationalize or understand how somebody who's, a selfish, greedy politician could be at the same point in evolution of a Mother Teresa or somebody like that, or even Princess Diana. But it's but uh, it's not necessarily. They said goodness is not necessarily the hallmark of somebody's point in evolution. They're not perfect. Neither was Mother Teresa. You know what I mean? But eventually, over time, they go. They they work through the steps and they they work. They run. They walk the path and they become a master. And then we look at them as wow. They're totally divine, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And that's the path that we're all headed to go to and then to become a master, right? But she's on that kind of par. So to say that she would be a master would be incorrect. And I'll, you know, I'll leave you with this. It's very difficult for any one of us to understand when we start hearing about these masters to really know what a master is and what they're like. And I'm even saying this for myself, you know? It's not until we see them on a daily basis perhaps on TV, in our own life, in the very near future, we'll see these masters. You know, we'll see the master who was John. You know, his name is Kuthumi. We'll see the master who was St. Germain or Francis Bacon, who was the master Rakuzi. We'll see the master Joao Kuhl. We'll see the master who was Paul. He goes by the, ma the name, the master Hilarion. We'll see the master who was Peter, who's the master Moria. We'll see the master Jesus. We'll see Maitreya. We'll see some of these other masters and we'll see how they live. We'll see their wisdom. We'll see how much they actually, all the knowledge that's just at their fingertips. Easy. You know, all the questions you have about ancient times, it's easy for them. It's like, whoop, it's right there. You know, the humor that they have, their humor them itself is a law. Their love is a law. They, they know nothing but love. You know, when you talk to them, they have no personal agenda. Nothing but true honesty of mind, sincerity of spirit, you know, the energy that comes from them, you know, it, that they will influence all of us, that will inspire all of us to be like them. You know, maybe not at first, but eventually all of us will inspire, uh, will aspire consciously to be like them because that's where we're headed. We're all divine, you know, and the, like I said, the love that they have, the, the patience that they will have with us how relaxed they are, even in the face of such crisis that we are in today. How, When you see Maitreya and recognize him on TV, you'll see somebody that's not, that shows no fear. He's, he knows no fear. Who knows, you know, uh, nothing but love. 
You know, I mean, that's what we'll see in these masters. And, and then it'll be easier for us to go, okay, well, Mother Teresa was, was a wonderful, beautiful lady who lived her life and served and she was great, but she's nowhere near being a master. It will make more sense. Do you see them? We'll see the ratio. And then we'll also see one of ourselves. I mean, there are people who think they're masters all the time and then they'll start to go, oh, wow, I'm nothing like that. <laughs> you know, it might be other people having to tell them first, like, hey, you know, you've been telling me you're a master this whole time. You ain't a master like them, you know? You still get upset. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I've never seen them get up. You know what I'm saying? It'll start, it might come to them like that, but eventually they'll see it, right? So it's always better for us to be, you know, know that we're not a master, right? And know that we're not there yet. But we can get there. We'll get there. You know what I mean? So hopefully that helps. And then lastly, um, uh, this comes from uh, Emily. She says, the last little bit gave me goosebumps. Be good. I definitely want to look into the healing water cream because I suffer from chronic pain as well. And I'm sorry about that. And hopefully they will help you. I am looking forward to changing the world with the masters soon. These are exciting times. And what she's talking about is the time that I saw Maitreya uh, on the streets of Marietta. And he said to me one time, and this is one thing he said that really stuck. He goes, you'll see me on TV real soon. And we're going to change the world together. So you have a great day. And thank you for everybody for asking questions. Remember to take action and help SOP save our planet. Thanks for listening, and we look forward to talking to you again in future videos.